Welcome to episode number 73 of the Marine Layer podcast. We welcome on Taylor Saucedo. We had a fantastic conversation with the Mariners lefty reliever, a Seattle native, a whole bunch of topics to discuss with him. We also have a conversation about Cody Bellinger and if it makes sense for the Mariners to sign him and do we think it's a good idea if the Mariners should sign him? A whole lot to debate there within the Cody Bellinger tree as a free agent this offseason. Your reminder before we start the show that if you're listening on our audio platforms, make sure you're following us, you download our episodes, you leave us a five-star review. That's across wherever you get your audio podcasts. Those reviews and downloads do help us out a bunch. Watch us on YouTube where the video side of the podcast is. Go like, comment, subscribe over there. and Follow us on social media on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube shorts at Marine Layer Pod. Let's get it rolling. And we welcome you to this episode of the Marine Layer Podcast, part of the Just Baseball Podcast Network, recording here on Monday, November 13th. The offseason has been in full swing for exactly a week. And why is Shohei Otani holding up the offseason? He should have signed by now. He's really holding up the whole offseason. You would think by now something would have happened. It doesn't even have to be the Mariners, but some move, some acquisition somewhere. We've had nothing. You could hear a pin drop on this hot stove right now because there has not been one trade, one free agent signing, anything that's been even somewhat noteworthy basically since free agency has started. And we discussed, I mean, these teams are waiting for him to make a decision. All the teams with the money to spend that are going to offer money to Shohei Otani are waiting to see if he accepts their money before the rest of the free agents shuffle through. I, like, I would actually be shocked if somebody like Cody Bellinger, who we're going to talk about today, signs before Shohei Otani, because there's no way a rational, uh, a irrational, I would say in, in that sense, I think it's it's a fair, a fair expectation, a, a team that would be willing to offer a 10 to 12 year contract, which I think is what Bellinger would get on the maximum end. But that's also what Shohei Otani is going to get. There's no way Cody gets that kind of contract before Shohei Otani signs. So For those other big dominoes to move, Shohei has to make a decision, or he has to at least to tell teams which teams he's not interested in so they can move on. Oh, I think Scott Boris would die before he let Cody sign before Shohei. Because what happens when Shohei signs? Cody becomes the premier bat on the market. So Boris is going to tell him, no, you're going to wait it out, and then we're going to see what teams will overpay to get a premier bat in free agency. Now, I don't really understand what Shohei Otani has to do with some of the middling free agents that could sign. Even the guys like somewhere in the Jamer Candelario range. I don't think Jamer Candelario and Shohei Otani are going to have much intertwining in free agency. Either a team can afford both of them or they could or they'll just get neither of them or maybe they just get one or the other. Like if a team signs Candelario, there's no reason they can't go out and get Shohei too. And if a team that's more of a mid-market team and doesn't spend a lot isn't interested in Shohei. Well, then they could go sign some of these mid-tier bats right now. So that's the part I don't understand. Sure, the Matt Chapmans, the Cody Bellingers, those guys are going to wait. But the guys, the level below them, like nothing. Like literally nothing so far in free agency. Even Teoscar Hernandez. like yeah. he, I would say he's, he's probably a little bit under the Matt Chapman level. But yeah. he's someone I think, at least is the talent level, that could sign before Otani does. If he knows where he wants to go, like say the Blue Jays are like, okay, well, we need some more thump in the outfield. We, our, our outfielders last year weren't as great offensively, and we'd love to have you back. Like, another, that, like that, Shohei Otani doesn't hold that up. Another perfect example of somebody who really isn't relying on Shohei to see what his market's going to dictate. Teoscar could go sign right now. And if a team that signs him is still interested in Shohei, they can go get Shohei. But the money Teoscar is going to get is not going to be close to what Otani gets. So if he knows where he wants to go, I don't see why that's holding anybody up. Yeah, it's been weird. Again, I thought Shohei would hold up a lot of the market. I didn't think he'd hold up the entire market because there's been nothing so far. There's been that Mark Canna trade. That's about it. And it holds up most of the trade market, too. I mean, the Mariners are really the perfect example of this because they need bats. But, like, the big bat they want on the free agent market before they they go shell out prospects for a bat is still sitting there waiting to make a decision. So they're not going to go give up precious resources until they until they know they can't get something as good on the free agent market that they think they have a chance in. 
It, it, it is, I think, a, a, a great example in, in that retrospect. So it has only been a week. Sometimes these things, like a say Juan Soto trade, take a little bit to piece together and structure and and get physicals and and get all the right ideas hammered out. When winter meetings roll around in a little over three weeks' time, I, we will have have had significantly more action. But for now, it's sort of just in a waiting pattern while these teams sort out and wait for the white whale to uh, submerge out of the uh, to it's not submerge. What's the opposite of submerge? Submerge. Emerge. Emerge. Yeah, emerge out of the ocean. Waiting for the white whale. And Cody Bellinger certainly falls into that category. Before we get more into him, because he is our big topic here on this first portion of the show, a quick word from our friends over at Pagotcha's Pub 85. Pagotcha's Pub 85 in Kirkland, the best spot in the area to go hang out with your friends, have some great food, drink some great drinks, and watch all the sports you can watch. Again, baseball might be over, football, basketball, hockey, anything else that you might desire sports-wise is going on, and they'll play it over there with their 22 TVs inside the restaurant if you head over there. They've got some great food. Certainly try the pizza, but a whole menu of great food options. Full drink menu with a bunch of great drinks. And if you're there during the weekday, during happy hour, you can cash in on some deals. Those happy hours are Monday through Friday, 2 to 6 p.m., which feature $3 domestic beers, $4 Manny's Blue Moons, $4 Mac and Jacks, $4 Wells, and $4 House Wines. Great food, great drinks, and great times with your friends over at Pagotcha's Pub 85 in Kirkland. Go check it out. Okay, so Cody Bellinger, bat number two on the market. Are the Mariners interested? Let me ask you this question. Would you be interested in a 12-year, $264 million contract? Absolutely not. Would you? That's a little bit much. It's the the difference in contract projections from Spotrack to MLB trade rumors is pretty massive. So Spotrack does, it's more of just a straight structure of his contract comparing similar uh, free agents at his position and similar age. And they came out to five for 112 at a 22 and a half AAV, which is about what he's worth. But then MLB trade rumors jumps out here and predicts that he's going to get $265 million over 12 years. I, I feel like somebody might offer him 12 years. 12 years seems a little ridiculous for Cody Bellinger given his last two seasons, but in this thin class and knowing what Cody has been in the past, it, it's entirely possible he gets $12 million or 12 years. And some teams might be thinking that's a bargain because I'm sure there might be some teams out there who look at Cody Bellinger and think MVP Cody Bellinger is still in there somewhere. Five for 112 sounds more intriguing. If that was actually around the ballpark of what his offers were going to be, I would say, okay, maybe the Mariners should be tuned in on this. 12 years, not only do I think that is a little irresponsible for a guy who is two seasons removed from a 47 WRC plus for the year that along with that, the Mariners would never shell out a 12 year contract for somebody in free agency, unless it was Shohei, they would not shell out a 12 year contract for Cody Bellinger, which is why not only do I think that would be a bad idea, but I don't think the Mariners would even entertain it. Do you think Cody and Scott and Mr. Scotty Boris would, so if they they're looking at this market and they see that they can't get a 12 year contract. So 12, a 12 year contract to put Cody Bellinger at age 40, and he could retire on that. They, he wouldn't need to worry about hitting the market again. But if he does, does five for 112, that spits him out into free agency again in his age 33 season, which if he goes out there and has a great five-year stretch over the prime of his career, that sets him up for a final eight to 10-year contract at a significantly inflated rate to what he would get right now in the future free agent market. I, I don't think that's the worst idea in the world either for the teams that want to sign, sign him currently because there would be more options with a five-year contract. And it wouldn't be terrible for Cody either, knowing that if he plays well for five years, he's going to get significantly more money. He could get that $264 million. I mean, he'd probably get more than $264 million in five years from now over a shorter uh, length of contract. Does he want to take that gamble, though? I, I feel like he has no interest in trying to test the market again at 33 years old. Because how many guys really thrive at 33 years old? Some, the hit rate for it is not 
that high. So if you're Cody, you come off a good year in Chicago, plus Scott Boris is your agent. I bet you they're looking at, let's get at least an eight-year deal, if not more. That's what I would guess, which is why Scott Boris and the Mariners almost never pair up. Jerry Depoto doesn't like to shell out huge contracts. Scott Boris wants nothing more than huge contracts for his players. So I feel like that's more the side they're leaning to right now, being Cody and Boris, which is, look, when Shohei's gone, it's all about me. We can get a lot of money from somebody if they'll pay it up. Let's discuss the player himself. You've been more against Cody than I have. Explain why. It's just that in two years, this guy went from being an MVP and putting up a 161 WRC plus to 47 in 2021, 47. So he didn't qualify among the league ranks that year. I don't think he had enough at bats or games played. Had he though, he would have been the single worst hitter in all of baseball that year with that WRC plus mark. Worst hitter in baseball. That was two years ago. And by the way, his 2022 campaign, it's not like it was some all-star year because his WRC plus that year jumped up from 47 to then 87, or it was in the eighties range, which great. Like that's well below league average. That is not appealing. If he had had one bad year, like say Cody had had a year in 2021 where that WRC plus mark was in the 80 to 90 range, maybe hit 19 20 homers still played some decent defense but then bounced back the last two years i'd say okay for the most part the track record's there when i look at two bad years in a row like that 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 is terrifying that feels like the exact type of guy also knowing with the mariners luck that they would sign him and that contract would just flop so that's my hesitancy with Cody. I think his powers significantly regressed over the last couple of years. I think he's been very inconsistent at the plate and I think he's going to demand a lot. So I don't, if the Mariners are going to have to wisely use their money, I don't know if Cody Bellinger is the best fit to go spend it. So all, your entire basis, it sounds like for not wanting to sign him is not the last year he had, but the two before that. Yeah. What he did in Chicago this past year was really good. 26 bombs. Had a great second half. We know he plays good center field defense. He can play the corners too. If you're really buying in on that 2023 season being a turn of the guard for Cody Bellinger and starting to find himself again, then sure, then I'd be open to it. I just, I cannot look past what happened in 21 and 22. That like, it's not just he was up and down. No, he was bad and really bad. Again, 2021, you're talking about maybe the worst hitter in baseball. So a guy that was two years removed from that, all of a sudden is getting $200 million from you. I'd, I'd be, I'd be squirming in my seat a little bit. I would be very, very nervous to see how that contract plays out in Seattle. Can I sell you on something? Okay. What if I told you Cody Bellinger in 2023 was a completely different hitter than he was with the Dodgers. I mean, completely different. And I'm talking good Cody and bad Cody. I'm talking about both of them. I'm talking about, he is a different hitter than when he won MVP, striking out only 16% of the time, walking nearly 15% of the time, being among the best hitters in baseball in 2019, and taking home the National League MVP. And like alongside his 47 WRC plus season, he is a different hitter than both those seasons. Because in both those seasons, he tried to be what he was in 2019. And 2019 was a success. 2021, it wasn't. He had some mechanical things. He changes his swing almost every single year. But what we saw in 2023 was a completely diff different version of Cody Bellinger. He struck out significantly less. He didn't walk nearly as much. His walk rate was only around 7% this year, which is below league average. He just essentially went to the plate and started swinging a whole bunch. And he made an effort not only to just swing a lot, but he was also going to cut down on his swing and miss against breaking pitches, which he did a magnificent job this season. I mean, he cut down his swing and miss against off seed in half. It was 31.4% the year prior uh, in 2022. And then breaking balls in general, he dropped that by 10%, 34% to 24%. Those are noticeable things. Those are things Cody definitely struggled with when he was in his final two years with the Dodgers. And he came to Chicago and he made a noticeable effort to sort of change what he became as a hitter. He's honestly what the Mariners want more in this off season. Besides the fact he's not right-handed, he makes a ton of contact while swinging a lot, super athletic, plays good defense in the outfield, 
and is a menace on the base paths. Like that sounds like the guy Jerry wants to go after this off season. Like that, that is it. And that's what Cody Bellinger was in 2023 in sort of a resurgence as a different baseball player than he was with the Dodgers. I will say it is interesting that in those 2021 and 22 seasons, even when he was struggling mightily, he didn't have some sky high strikeout rate. It was about 27% both years, which is not great. It's not terrible. It's very manageable. 26, 27% K rate. It was not in the thirties, the way Teoscar and Gino have had theirs and certainly past years. Does the fact that Cody chases a decent amount scare you off at all? So yes, he does not actually strike out, but there is a little bit of chase in his game. And it's been that way his whole career, including this past year. It It is, I would say, a little bit concerning. But that I would say that just kind of the profile of how it is, because if you're going to swing a lot, you're probably going to chase a lot. But even with him swinging a lot, he wasn't swinging and missing a whole bunch. There could be some regression there, 100%. But we also need to remember he wasn't playing in the most hitter-friendly park in the world in in Wrigley Field. So, you know, he did probably go through a little bit of that, give give or take, at some points of the season. If there's something you were to be actually concerned about, you might think his power numbers are a little bit more inflated. He had the sixth highest difference between his actual slugging and his expected slugging. His actual slugging was 525 this year. His expected slugging was around 430. Now, he makes up for that in a couple of ways, and Mike Petriello wrote an article all the way back in May about this, but a lot of the points he made in that article still stand true for Cody's entire season. He got some bounces here and there that helped him out because his quality of contact also wasn't great, which is why his expected slugging was a little bit lower, but you know, his speed bails him out of a lot of things. Like You can have crummy contact, but if you're as fast as Cody Bellinger is, a single turn into, into a double very quickly. Or a double turns into a triple very quickly if you if you have the wheels to do so. So when he's grabbing those extra bases, it, it inflates the number a little bit, even though if the quality of contact doesn't the, doesn't reflect it as much. I would say if there's actually a concern, I would say it'd be his quality of contact numbers instead of his chase numbers, because you know if you chase but you're still still hitting the ball really hard, you can be like Teoscar Hernandez was this year on the road, where you're still striking out a bunch. But in a better hitting environment, you're still crushing the baseball. Cody's quality of contact is not what Teo, his. It's not what Teoscar Hernandez is, is. It's middle of the pack to below average, actually. So that was the that was the next thing I was going to bring up was does the quality of contact scare you at all? Because outside of 2019, when he just had his ridiculous MVP campaign, yeah, he's never been a guy that's just barreled the hell out of baseballs. It's just not his game. It doesn't mean he's not a good player. It doesn't mean he doesn't put up great production. He's just not a huge barrel rate guy. He doesn't get a, like a ton of barrels per year. But you know what? If Teoscar couldn't do that in T-Mobile Park, this, if Teoscar could not put the season together in Seattle that we all thought he was going to put together despite his hard-hit profile saying, oh, he'll be fine no matter where he goes, then maybe you just say, screw it. For the Mariners, it, it doesn't matter what the hard hit profile is or what Jesse Winker was compared to what Teoscar was to compare to what Cody Bellinger is like, maybe there's no rhyme or reason for T-Mobile park. Maybe that's just how tough a place it is to hit where with Cody, you just buy the fact that maybe he changed some things. Maybe he is a new hitter and maybe he can thrive here because he is more of a bat to ball guy now and a contact guy now. And, but yeah, you just won't hit the ball all that hard. And unlike those two guys, he's a complete player. I mean, baseball savant had him 81st percentile or higher in all three of batting, fielding, and base running run value. You can't say that for those three. For the other two. you mean The other two, sorry. You can't say that for the other two. No, you can't. And and that's what makes Cody Bellinger's floor at least somewhat safe. Even when he is in a massive slump, even when he can't hit the broad side of a barn, he will play defense. He has always played defense, and he's pretty fast. So usually he's a center fielder. Now, obviously, if he was here in Seattle, he would not be playing center field. But he can play the corners. He could play right field. And if that's the case, you could put Bellinger in right. You could have Julio in center. You could have Kelnick in left. And I think Cody Bellinger would play a perfectly good right field, if not a really good right field. So, look, I still have my concerns. I do like the fact that he turned things around in 2023. But maybe I'm using less logic here with my reasoning and too much, like, emotion. But we've just seen so many contracts and trades flail out for the Mariners over the years that just seeing what Cody did over those last couple of years 
scares me in the sense of just the Mariners' luck, right? To, oh, give him a big contract, and then it flops. Now, maybe, again, maybe logically, he is a changed guy at the plate. But just the emotional side of this, what what my brain's saying to me is, uh, like, what are the odds it happens again with the Mariners? And you made, a, you made a good point before. You would have less of a problem with this if the Mariners' budget was bigger. But we know the Mariners' budget is, is not infinite. In fact, it is far from infinite. If this was Steve Cohen making this decision, you'd say, oh, okay, I mean, that's, that's not a big deal. We know the budget can have $150 more million on it if, if that's what it requires. But that's not the case with Cody Bellinger. If they sign Cody Bellinger to a 12-year contract, that, I mean, that's like it for the offseason mm-hmm. for the most that's part. It. That's it. That'd be their one big move. Maybe they'd make a lateral trade or two, but they're not making any more big impact moves like that. So that would be it. Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit pre-recording where I said if this was Steve Cohen, he'd sign anybody. If it didn't work out in a few years, like if Cody was that bad and went back to 2021 Cody Bellinger, if this was Steve Cohen as the owner, he'd probably say, all right, we'll release him. I'll eat the money. We'll go sign somebody else. We know John Stanton's not doing that. And we know Jerry DePoto hates constructing a roster like that. So again, if this was a five to six year deal for Cody Bellinger, I would be very, very much listening with wide open ears saying, all right, let's talk about this. Let's really think about this. Could he come here and change this offense? If it's going to cost 10 to 12 years and a fat contract, I'm a little more skeptical. He just see it. It just seems like too. Uh, like, first of all, we see no links to Seattle at all. There has been no reporting that Cody Bellinger is interested in signing at Seattle. I don't know. I don't actually think we think that the Mariners are interested in signing Cody Bellinger, which, you know, maybe if they're in a bigger market and they had more cash at hand, they would at least check in on him and they might get mentioned in a couple of these reports as places Cody Bellinger could be interested in. But the only two places I'm seeing really is the Cubs and the Yankees. I mean, the Cubs really liked him. He really liked playing in Chicago. I mean, he had a career resurgence in Chicago. His time in Chicago is the reason that he's about to become generationally wealthy in this free agent market. And the Yankees, as we know, desperately need outfielders besides Aaron Judge. And Cody Bellinger seems like a pretty good fit for that. The Giants seem to be in on him too. So if you want a third team in the mix, San Francisco, and they certainly have money to spend as we've seen from their failed attempts to sign some free agents in the last couple of off seasons. But yeah, it does feel like it'd be the Yankees or the Cubs. And if I had to place a bet anywhere, I feel like he'd probably go back to Chicago, despite Scott Boris's ridiculous quotes, which we talked about on Friday's show at length. But yeah, it, it just seemed like a fit there. It just seemed like he was really comfortable there. He seemed like he liked the team. He liked the fan base. He liked the area and he thrived. So if he went back to the Cubs, I certainly would not be shocked. And, and that's the bigger part of this, right? Is, is Cody and Scott Boris have to be willing to listen to potentially playing in Seattle. I will say, I'm going to give you a round of applause here because you actually did a decent job sales pitching me on the Cody Bellinger idea in the sense of he's a new hitter. He has changed some things. He's not quite the guy he was when he was struggling mightily in 21 and 22. But it still circles back to the idea of would the Mariners even entertain this? And would Scott Boris and Cody Bellinger entertain this? And and I don't know if either of those things are going to happen. I don't, yeah, I don't know if Scott's flying Cody up to Seattle. I don't think so. If Simeon did, wasn't coming to Seattle, which was a fit, as we, we said, it was a fit. I don't, I don't know if Cody's, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Even if the Mariners were interested, Cody Bellinger would be taking a meeting with the Seattle Mariners. So that would be an interesting fit. It's going to be fun to see where, where Cody ends up, though, because we're, I, like Cody, when he's playing well, is such a fun baseball player. And he, again, he made the Cubs significantly better this year, and he was, very, very good on the Dodgers. We saw the upside that he has, although to his own fault, a little bit too much tinkering. It's like you tinker with your fantasy football lineup before you roll out on a Sunday. Well, it seemed like that's what Cody Bellinger was doing every year with his swing, and it it did not work out very well for him, and that's why he's ended up in this situation. You can only imagine if he just kept going off that 2019 season. I mean, he'd he'd be probably pushing $400 million. Oh, yeah. 265 is, you know, enough. Just maybe not for the Mariners. Again, I think you did a good job convincing me and hopefully some listeners, too, of, oh, maybe maybe Cody really has changed some things. And and again, if this was the Mariners, if this was a five or six year contract on the table, I'd really 
well, to begin with, if it was a five or six year deal, I'd kind of be all ears, but you would have sales pitched me even more. Maybe even if you stretch it to seven, but when you get into those double digit years, it just gets a little frightening for most guys. Honestly, most guys not named Shohei or somebody like that. It gets a little frightening, but somebody will give it to them. That's for sure. Would you have, uh, okay, so let's just play a slight game here now that we've seen two years of the contract. If you were to go back to 2021 and let's throw out all the extracurriculars of what is what had happened with the Mariners that season with a certain uh, franchise icon, if you had the option to sign Corey Seager to a 12-year contract, would you do it? So with no knowledge of what he's done since then, right? Uh, no, I would say you know you know what he's done now, but I'm oh. saying uh, the situation with Kyle Seeger, the like probably let's say it doesn't exist because that obviously had a factor. Oh, yeah, I would give Corey Seeger a 12 year contract now, 100 percent after seeing what he's yeah. done in his first two years in Texas. Again, that's knowing what we know now. Back then, I probably would have said no way. Now, oh yeah, I'd give it to him. I think okay. it's also fair to say Corey Seeger is. Probably a better player than Cody Bellinger is, despite Cody having an MVP to his name. I think I think Corey's worth a lot more. Yeah, well, if it wasn't for some two way guy named Shohei, I think Corey would have an MVP to his name. So mm-hmm. that would be yeah, it. Would. But it'll be it'll be interesting. And again, sometimes these long contracts work. They sometimes they actually do. Sometimes they don't. And that's why you run the risk of seeing seeing if it's going to work out. Before we get to our conversation with Taylor Saucedo, let's hear a word from BetterHelp. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Regardless, if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or you're just a human who lives in this world who is going through a hard time, therapy can give you the tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible. And this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you with a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in our description. It's betterhelp.com slash marine layer pod. That's betterhelp.com slash marine layer pod. Clicking the link helps support this podcast, but also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash marine layer pod. Glad we were able to make the connection with Taylor Saucedo. You have a little bit of a family connection with his family, which helps with your connection with him on the field and ability to eventually now get him here onto this podcast yeah we're pretty excited about this one so when you're listening to us record this part here we have not yet done the interview with taylor doesn't mean we're not looking forward to it in fact we are very very much so looking forward to it because it's funny i I think taylor has a lot of similar interests to the two of us sitting right here he grew up a seattle sports fan grew up in the area he's a big star wars guy he's active on social media I'd, i'd say we check all those boxes right yeah i would say so So he's a fan favorite for a very good reason. You saw how much fans began to love Saucedo in his first year pitching here because he was very real. You could relate to him a lot. He's a fun guy. I mean, you you saw him with the helmet on running around pregame when when the Mariners social team would would tweet it out with, with the Seahawks helmet on, throwing the football around, all that stuff. So we're really looking forward to talking to him because I think there's a lot we've got to ask him about. I think it's going to be a really, really fun conversation, and we can't wait for you guys to hear it. So let's get to our conversation and hear from Taylor Saucedo. All right, we've got Taylor Saucedo, reliever for the Seattle Mariners. I was scrolling through your Twitter account, by the way, the other day, and I'm scrolling through some of the replies. What do I come across? You respond to some tweet that says something about nominate Taylor Saucedo for People's Sexiest Man of the Year. And you respond saying, oh, yeah, like, I'm all for that. So actions speak louder than words here. So my question is, like, what photos are you submitting for this? Oh, man. <laughs> um, it'd probably have to do the uh, probably a sports photo, obviously. And then uh, one in a suit. Give it my best look. So one of those two. Are we talking men's warehouse type of suit or where do you get your suits at? 
Uh, I just had a bias, dude, because I went to that uh, toy fundraiser that Rick Riz put on. Um, and I went and got it at Suit Supply. So I don't really. It's a nice suit. I thought it looked good. Uh, but yeah, that was in Bellevue. What's your sales pitch outside of the photos? <laughs> um, that I got a uh, similar body type to DK Metcalf. So <laughs> <laughs> that's always my pitch, too. We need that photo at some point. I don't know if you've got connections to DK or not for the two of you to line up next to each other, but that photo I, uh, will go viral across Seattle sports Twitter. I if you actually ever do. It. I have a photo with uh, Tyler Lockett and DK. Oh. Um, and I do show people because they always, they always laugh when I say that. And I'm like, every time I show them, they're like, wait, okay, you might be onto something. So um, <laughs> yeah, I'll probably tweet that out someday, but yeah. Okay, speaking of the Seahawks, we figured before we got into any baseball stuff, as three people that are Seattle natives and just Seahawks fans, we figured we could just kind of shoot the breeze about the Seahawks for a couple minutes here, which I know you spend time kind of tweeting about, and I know you're religiously watching just like we are. So I figured I'd just start somewhere, and then you can kind of take it wherever you want to take it. I guess I'll start here. Is it crazy to say that Devin Witherspoon legit might be an all-pro as a rookie? Uh, Not at all. Um, that guy, that guy sets the tone on the field every time and he's always making some big play, you know, he's always out there and, you know, he's, he's doing what, uh, what Woolen's doing did last year, you know, but I think he's doing it at a, at a, at a better rate right now. So he's, he's awesome to watch. Which side of this Gino train are you on? Are, are we in the, are, like, I'm like team support Gino because <laughs> it, it could, it could be significantly worse as we turn on our TVs and watch every Sunday. So, like, I don't know where you're at with this. I, I mean, I I like Gino. I like Gino a lot. I was on the Gino train when he came in and when Russell got hurt for the four games a couple years ago. Um, obviously, I supported him last year and, and this year. You know, I think the one thing that I've watched is I don't necessarily think it's him, more so the play calling. I think, you know, something that you saw last week against the Commanders was – in that last drive specifically as they were running a lot of short intermediate routes and letting DK run those routes instead of just flying him, you know, up the seams. So I think that if we can go back to what Gino did last, what, well, last year was, you know, those short intermediate throws. And I think if we can get back to those. I think he's going to be just fine. And obviously it kind of feels like we've gotten away from our run game and it feels like we have a pretty good one, two punch with that. And then I think they just need to utilize that a lot more. But again, I'm not a football expert, but that's just my opinion. I think that's some pretty good analysis. I mean, that was basically along the lines of what I was going to say is I'm still team Gino. It sounds like all three of us are in the same boat on that regard. I also feel like they've kind of gotten away from using some of the tight ends a little bit. So back to your point about the intermediate passes, like early in the year when they were really thriving offensively, I felt like more of that was mixed in and there's been less of that in the last couple of games. Yeah, 100 percent. I couldn't agree more. Man, so what's the ceiling for this team? I mean, like, like, are your expectations legitimately like Super Bowl? A hundred percent. I wouldn't think anything different. Uh, I'm pretty sure I tweeted it out already too. So, um, but no, I mean, I think they have a great defense. They're young. They're going to fly around. I think uh, Leonard Williams is going to provide that boost. Um, you know, and obviously we have the offensive weapons. Just got to figure out how to use it. You know. Um, but that's always the issue when you have weapons like that. You know, I mean, we have Bobo, and I think he's great. I think he needs to be used a little bit more. But then you have JSN in front of him, you know, and, and obviously Lockett and DK. So it's like, how do you do that? And I think they're they're going to figure that out towards the end. You know, I have faith, especially with Pete. Um, you know, we'll see what what Waldron does with the offense. But you know, I think we're going to be I think we're going to be good. You don't really have to worry about the defense right now. Um, you know, especially with how young they are, they look great. Bobby's back there, he's plugging up holes is what we needed. So, you know, I'm ceiling's high for me. Lyle, you can count me as someone who's not quite as optimistic. I'll need to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it I. Well, I'm like I, I watched those Niners games last year. I'm like I'm gonna need to I'm gonna need to see it. I'm, the Niners, I'm, I'm the gonna Niners need to see vulnerable. some. Well, not last week. <laughs> no, not last week, but it, yeah, that was tough. Tough for, if if uh, they go out there on Thanksgiving and make Thanksgiving a lot better for all of us, then I, I might reconsider. But like, I, I feel like there's still that we still got that gap between the, there's the Eagles, there's the 49ers, and then there's like the Grand Canyon, and then there's the rest of the <laughs> NFC. And I feel like 
the 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 Seahawks are still on the wrong side of that Grand Canyon. Till till I see proven otherwise, they're going to have a fantastic chance to to prove me wrong here in the next month. Yeah, it should be fun. I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah, if they go three and one in that four game stretch with Dallas, the Niners twice, the Eagles, like then all of a sudden maybe now, my now opinion we're changes. believing. Yeah, now we're believing. <laughs> exactly. Honestly, even if they go two and two in those games, I'll be believing a lot more because then that would say, all right, yeah. they can hang with the big guys in the NFC. But absolutely, uh, look. I don't think anybody's complaining about six and three, six and three, six and three. If we were going to transition over to baseball a little bit again, some, okay. I wanted to start with this. It's something a little bit more on the lighthearted note, because I know you're from here and you grew up in the area. I want to call back something that I want to say I heard around the summertime. So I'm standing around in one of Scott services, media sessions, and he's just talking, you know, he's answering questions like usual. You walk by, it was toward the end. And Scott goes, you guys have to get a load of this guy. He says about Saucedo. He goes, this guy calls me or he tells me when he gets in today that he got lost driving to the stadium. And I'm thinking to myself, isn't Taylor a Seattle guy? So like, I, I don't know, like, how does that happen? Well, um, that day was just the day that was a lot of bad traffic and Siri rerouted me. Um, and I didn't really know where I was at. You know, obviously I didn't grow up in the city of Seattle, so I didn't exactly know. I didn't have service. So it was just a bit of a disaster. And we got stuck in traffic. But if he's referring to the time where I did get lost in Seattle was after the uh, Kraken playoff game. Because I got lost twice. This didn't, this didn't happen once. This, uh, you know. And uh, I've, I've heard Paul tell this story um, on one of his interviews, which is fantastic that that's out there now. So, um, but yeah, I got lost um, after the Kraken game. I was supposed to... We had a day game, and at the time, because I just got called out from Tacoma, and I uh, was still living out there, so I didn't. We had a day game the next day, so I didn't want to drive all the way back and then drive all the way back here. So I got a hotel, and Gabe and Topo were gonna give me a ride back, but their car got broken into. Um, so I was like, uh, I told him, I was like, you guys can just go ahead. I'll just make it easier for you. You know, you got a lot going on. I'll just Uber. I'm like a mile away from my hotel right now. We'll be fine. And they were like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I'll be fine. And what I didn't realize was my phone was at like 4%. And um, they take off. And as soon as they took off, my phone died. And the Uber was stuck because of the game and everything. They were stuck. They couldn't get down here. So I was just like, all right, I'm just going to walk to a gas station and buy a charger. That should be fine. Ended up not being fine. I got lost within the city, and I left the game probably at like 8 o'clock, 8, 8.30. And uh, I didn't get home until like 12.40. And Because wow. <laughs> I, I would think I was up all the way up in like uh, Queen Anne up in the hills. And I... Uh, I just kept trying to take left and I could never get out of it, could never get out of it. <laughs> and I was walking for hours. I was sweating. I was so thirsty. I was like, dude, this sucks. And I sit down on a bench in this neighborhood and I'm just like sitting there like, how am I going to get home? How am I going <laughs> to do this? And I just so happened to look up and I'm like, well, they do say follow the North Star home. So I'll just follow this star for as long as I can. And it brought me over to this hill, and it was just Seattle. I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh, my God. I was probably like three miles still, and I just started running towards it. And I eventually got back, and I got into a, a hotel. I told them, I was like, my phone's dead. Um, I'm staying at a Marriott. I was there any way that you can look it up? They're like, yeah, you got like another two miles. I was like, is there a gas station around? They're like, yeah, it's across the street. And I was at that hotel to start the night or to start this whole journey. And I missed the gas station across the street. So I'm like, I could have avoided this whole disaster. <laughs> and so, yeah, once I told everybody that, uh, Scott was like, did you, did you live here? Like, how do you, how does this happen? <laughs> I was like, I don't want to talk about it. So yeah, it was, it was a bit of a rough night. 
I'll, I'll say Taylor as someone who's had some late nights in the area. So I grew up in Ballard. Like you, you, you know, it, it gets dark and, and, and you're walking around. But the, the thing is, it's like, okay, am I going towards the water? Am I going away from the water? Am I going uphill? Am I going downhill? None of that was like kick in. It's like, Oh, like my hotel is downtown. Perhaps I should walk towards the skyscrapers. <laughs> I have, that's what I was trying to do, but I couldn't, I, this neighborhood, it was like a maze. I'm telling you, it was like, I felt like I was amazed from it. Couldn't see anything. I'm like trying to look for like the brightest lights, like seeing if I could see the space, nothing. And I was just trapped. I, I kept taking laps. So I'm like, surely if I keep taking a left, I'll get back to where I'm supposed to go. <laughs> no, it didn't, didn't work out. Okay. So again, it was dark and it sounds like, well, just to clarify, you were walking at one point during this, walk, right? You said I walked the whole way for for four hours. I was walking. Okay, so it was dark, but at any point while you were walking and kind of making your way throughout your whole journey, was there anybody who you walked by that kind of looks over and is like, "Is that Taylor Saucedo just <laughs> trying to like walk up a hill or something?" <laughs> no, no, not yet. No, it wasn't any of that. It was just I only saw like maybe one or two people in this neighborhood. It was a nice neighborhood, so that was that was good. But no, I never, I never saw anybody. I was like, I hope, honestly, I was like, I hope nobody sees me, because at this <laughs> point, I'm like, I'm sweating, I'm my mouth dry, I'm like, this sucks. So, yeah, like, no. would you believe me if I told you I was a big league pitcher? And they'd be like, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what we all talked about. I was like, yeah, I would have gotten to the point of being like, hey, I'm not a crazy person. Like, I, I would have been like, I play for the Mariners, I'm lost, I need help. Like, but luckily. I was guided by the North Star, so we made it home. Well, that's good. When it, yeah, when in doubt, follow the uh, follow <laughs> yeah. the North Star. So is that like one of the things? D- did you guys just while well, you guys are in the bullpen? I think this is like a question I'll probably ask after this. But is it like, do you guys go around the around the bullpen then and decide and and like talk about like yeah, that's the third inning. You guys don't have to pitch or warm up yet. It's like all right, what's your favorite story about getting lost somewhere? Oh yeah, yeah, we share. Uh... Definitely from, like, the first to, like, the fourth inning, we're kind of just, like, sharing stories, talking, you know, BSing and all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, there's there's been a lot of funny stories that were shared. If you were to, I would say, a podcast-appropriate topic of something you guys talk about in the bullpen, like, what like what happens in a major league bullpen, let's say, in those first four innings? <laughs> just a whole lot of nonsense, really. <laughs> um, you know, I... I don't know if I could share any of them currently, but you know, there it's it's a good time, especially with that group that we had. They were they were awesome. Like everybody just matched. Like when you find people that all share the same personality together, it's it's a good time. So a lot of good laughs. Um, but I don't know if any are appropriate for the, the podcast. <laughs> Who's the best storyteller? Uh, um probably me i'll probably give myself that one i feel like i was the one sharing most of the stories but yeah so probably (laughs) okay so who's second uh trent probably trent also has really good stories i've I've obviously been with him with the blue jays and he's he he could tell a good story i've got one i know you said you're not you don't want to bring most of the stuff up that you guys talk about but i got one because one of the questions we asked a couple guys on the mini mic this year is we asked them if you could go back and see any moment in baseball history what would it be we asked isaiah campbell this question and he goes you know honestly due to some pretty compelling conversations in the bullpen i want to go back in time and see if babe ruth was a real person or not (laughs) so so now i gotta ask like like on behalf of all mariners fans like where is the bullpen out on this? Is Babe Ruth a real person or not? No, we don't. We don't. We don't think he exists. We, uh, you know, there's not a lot of videos of him playing. It's just like you know, pictures or like one like of the same video that we always see him trotting around or doing something. So we're pretty strong on that. He doesn't exist. And that uh, who was it? Ted Williams hit that like 500 foot homer or whatever it was at uh, uh, Fenway. Um, yeah, that never happened either. So, <laughs> okay. I think, the ba- uh, go ahead, Lyle. The Babe Ruth thing, I can actually like be open minded about because, like, I've heard people say similar things, and that is a good point. It's always that same one video, of Babe Ruth, like in black and white, takes a swing, fast trot around the bases. That's it. Like that called shot everybody talks about. Like, there's no video of that. There's no well, like, like I've never, no. It's just a picture. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, we're we we all like to get into you know conspiracy talks like that, so um, it's fun. <laughs> Everyone brings a different point of view into it, but we're all pretty much the same. So then, did you guys walk out to the Ted Williams seat? Yeah, and we sat out there, and we're like, no chance, no, <laughs> yeah. no chance back then. It was anybody hitting this, and if like guys like David Ortiz with metal bats can't put it out there then you're, there's just no way that they're doing that back in the day with whatever kind of wood they were using. So there's just no way. Man, I've never heard the Ted Williams argument, though. I Again, this is what I could be open-minded to. I never yeah, even really we, thought about it. You got a lot of time in the bullpen. You're going to cover every, pretty much every <laughs> topic you can, you know. So um, you got to keep it interesting. Okay, so in terms of how you got to Seattle, right? I mean, you spent a couple years with Toronto. You had a brief little stint with the Mets. Um, but then, ultimately, before 2023 starts, you end up with the Mariners. So when you get the call and, and, and you w- eventually worked out that, oh, this is where you're going to play your baseball in 2023, like as somebody who grew up here, what's your first reaction when you find out, yeah, I'm coming home to play baseball? Man, honestly, like it. Like my stomach drop, you know, like everything. I think that moment in time, everything stopped for me, uh, you know, because when they when they called me, when the Mets called me, obviously, like I was shocked in the first place that I was picked up because obviously, you know, I didn't have great numbers and I was hurt all last year. Then then the Mets called and they're like, hey, we claimed you. And then you're like, OK, cool. And then, you know, I get DFA'd again and, you know, you're like, all right, well, I was lucky enough the first time and I actually, the first day that they called, I got DFA'd and I'm just like, well, let me just take a look at what the Mariners situation are with lefties, you know, and I was looking at their bullpen at the time, everything looked pretty solid. So I was like, okay, well, that's just, you know, that's just a dream come true. But, um, you know, I'll probably end up back in Syracuse. And so when they called me again, uh, the Mets and they were like, hey, just wanted to let you know. Uh, you've been claimed by the Seattle Mariners. And I was like, what did you, I was like, what did you just say? She was like, (laughs) yeah, you just got claimed by the Seattle Mariners. And I was like, I, at that point, I didn't hear anything that she said. I didn't process anything. She said I ran in there. My mom was like doing something because I was staying uh, with them during this time. And uh, she was like making some food and she was like listening to music. And I just went over and I was like, kind of like slapping her on the shoulder. And she was like, what do you want? And I was like, I was like, I'm a Seattle Mariner. And she was like, what? And then she ran into my uh, stepdad's office and he was like on a meeting. And she was like, get off your meeting, get off your meeting. And she was like, what do you want? Like, this is a port meeting. And he was like, he's like, you know, Taylor just got picked up by the Mariners. And uh, he just, he, he was like, I gotta go. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty surreal. I did a couple of paces in the backyard. Like, man, this is, this is crazy. Like, this is actually happening. And then when I got that phone call and it just comes over Seattle Mariners, you know, and I'm like, wow, this is, this is crazy. So yeah, it was pretty surreal. Before I ask you, I guess about like what you've done this season with the Mariners, like off of how you built all this excitement going to play for the Mariners you're the same generation of Mariner fans as we are so like what what was the what was the thing I think that sticks out to you most from your childhood about the Mariners and building that connection um I just like honestly like when I went to the field for the first time in spring training and uh you see Mike Cameron's in there and you see Ichiro and you know you're seeing Edgar and I'm like Dude, these are the guys that I watched growing up, and now I'm just going to work with them. Like, now we're just sharing the same clubhouse. Like, that was really when I was like, man, this is happening. And then you're walking down the spring training, you're seeing, like, all the murals of all the people that have played here before. And, you know, I just – it kind of re reamped my, my love for baseball. Like, obviously, I love baseball and, you know, everything, but, like, being able to go in there and you walk into the clubhouse for the first time and you see that jersey hanging and you're like, everything that you went through led to this moment right here. Like, you know, I'm just going to try and enjoy it as much as I can. No matter what happens, 
Like I can say that, hey, I got to put on this uniform for for however long, but at the end of the day, like you made a dream that only a certain amount of people who grow up and they want to play a sport, they want to play in the big leagues and able to play for their hometown team. There's not many doing that. And so that was just like, hey, that's a check mark. That's great. You know, let everything else fall into place and see what happens. And so it was really cool. I assume Ichiro was the first person you went up to to try and talk to. I couldn't even talk to him. I, I panicked. Um, he was like, <laughs> he was walking down the the hallway and I saw him and like immediate, immediate nervous sweats. And I just kind of like paced. I was like, and I turned around and I was like, went back to my locker. I was like, why did I do that? Why did I do that? And so I uh, eventually ended up talking to him later and it was pretty crazy when, uh, he came up and he was like, Hey Taylor. And I was like, I'm on first name basis with each row. Okay, sure. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. So, uh, another cool moment, um, was to, is when I was, when I was younger, I had a, uh, broken bat, um, from Mike Cameron and I've had it with me in a case, um, since I was a kid. And, uh, once I found out Mike was around a lot, um, I asked my parents to ship out the bat and uh, right after one of our morning meetings, um, I went up to him and I showed him and he was like, he's like, how did you get this? And I, I told him the story and I was like, I've had it since I was a little kid. Like you were one of my favorite players growing up. I was like, you think you could sign this? He was like, of course, you know, he's going around showing everybody the bat. He's like, this is the wood you need, like stuff like that. It's like really cool. <laughs> so it's just like, just like really cool moments in spring training. I'm just like, man. This is a this is just a dream come true. What's it like having Ichiro around the clubhouse during the regular season when 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 he's available to be there? <laughs> it's like a celebrity seeing just like the biggest celebrity you know. I mean, it's just really cool, and like he's so down to earth, and it's just funny because like he does the same stuff we're doing, and he's still like you like that dude could probably play like if yeah. somehow we lose like three outfielders or something like. You know, I feel like he could be that emergency, like 10 day contract kind of thing. And you could put him out there and, you know, and he still looks good. It's, it's awesome to watch him do his thing and just be present and still continue to love the game. Like it's awesome. Okay. So major league baseball in the next couple of years is starting to float out the idea of doing this legends home run derby. Like how, like it, David Ortiz said he was down and A-Rod said he was down how can we use how, how can you use your poll to get Ichiro into that thing? Because one of the things I always said about Ichiro is I think that guy could legit win a home run derby. Yeah, I mean you hear about that all the time. Like growing up, they're like he doesn't he doesn't hit a lot of homers, but he can if he wanted to. And so, and obviously, I, you know, I'm sure you guys saw that video of him breaking that window the other day. I don't know how recent it, that is, or if that was you know this year or what. Um, but like that guy can that guy can still swing it, you know, and I'm sure. If he did get to that point, I'm sure his name would be thrown in quite a bit. Um, so that that would be really cool to watch. What do you feel like the Mariners did both? Okay, so what do you feel like once you got to the Mariners, both you did with your kind of approach and repertoire and what the Mariners helped you with that really seemed to click for you this year? Because the Mariners do seem to have a reputation over the last few years of helping a lot of relievers just kind of be their best selves. So what do you think they did with you? Well, it's it's so crazy because like they didn't do they didn't change anything about me when I got here. They, uh, you know, they brought me in and they had a meeting and I've never had a meeting like it before. And they basically just sit you down. They put this whole whiteboard in front of you and they just basically tell you, here's what you do really well. And even when you make mistakes, here's what teams are hitting, you know. They're like, if you just take the all of your stuff and you just put it in that box, in that strike zone, like you're going to have success. And all they do is they just pump your tires. They're like, you belong here. You can do this. You can be a big contributor. And you start to think you're like, okay, yeah, really? It's, it's, it's actually not that hard. Like, and they're like, yeah. And even though, you know, it's, it's still hard, right? It's still the big leagues, but like, they just simplify it to where you're like, wow and they show you all those numbers and you're and it's just kind of eye-opening because like you know with with the blue jays it was different you know they were like hey don't do this don't do that 
you know, stay away from this. But then when I got here, I never heard the words don't and no and can't. I never heard those. They were like, do, 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 and be you. That's their biggest thing is like, be you and do these things because you do them really well. You're just not throwing them or your usage isn't here or, you know, you're not throwing it in the correct area. Like all you have to do is move around your sites. They're just really smart in identifying the pitchers and the players that they want and able to get the best out of them, regardless of what they've done before. Like they just know because they're really good with those numbers, metric wise, analytically wise, and they don't shove it down your throat. They're just like, hey, this is what you do. Continue doing that and don't get away from it. And you're like, okay. And it's funny because like I said that coming in here when I was like, I've never had a meeting like that. And then we got Trent and they had the same meeting with him. And I remember he came out uh for bp and, and to throw and he was like i've never had a meeting like that and i was like i said the same exact thing like <laughs> you know and it's just like it's just really cool and, and organic to see that and you know there's after seeing what i've seen it, it's not a shocker that they can get the best out of you know practically anybody you know i mean i mean look what they did with topa like that guy was in indie ball and, you know, you know, thinking about not playing baseball anymore. And then now he's, you know, a high end reliever and one of the best relievers in baseball. You know, it's just, it's incredible to watch and, and, you know, especially to be a part of. What part of your game you think benefited the most from that? Um, in like, in like what way? Like, uh, let's say in like your, it just in your like pitching style. Just honestly, what I benefited from it was just trust. Like I didn't, like, like I said, when I was, when I was with the Blue Jays, it was a lot of, Hey, don't do that. Stay away from this with righties. And so I just kind of felt like I put myself in a box and it almost was like, man, they really know what's going to come. And the Mariners are like, you have five pitches. You might as well use it. All of them can play. There's not one that we think that we need to get rid of. Just throw it and trust it. And, you know, like I wasn't throwing my change up that much. And they were like, how come you've only thrown it 32 times? And I'm like, I don't know. They're like, we want you to throw that a lot more. Like obviously triple those numbers, you know, and just do stuff. They're just stuff like that. And you're like, okay, yeah, well, uh, yeah, that's a very simple fix, you know? And so they're just, they're just really good at getting the best out of that player. And, um, I just, uh, I, for me, like to, to instill that confidence in for me, like I can't, I can't thank them enough. And I, they've done it for a lot of people and you could really feel like that belief and that, and that, that's huge, especially for guys that are DFA or up and down, and you know, don't have a, a place where like they, they've fully stayed in the big leagues, like to that, for them to look at you and you can fully believe that. And it, it it's, it's huge. How do you measure your success? What kind of numbers do you look at? Like, for example, on this podcast, like we dive like really deep. We're we're looking at baseball savant. We're looking at fan graphs. All these these numbers to try and determine how successful you guys are on the baseball field. How do you, as a player, determine how successful you are? Um, just like for me, especially for for me from last year, is like availability. Like, can I be a factor when you need me? Can I stay healthy? You know, all year. Um, am I available to go back to back? Am I available to go, you know, four out of six, whatever it is, um, that, that's what I looked at, you know, in a game of, you know, in a schedule of 162 games, like you're going to fail in between that. That's just how it's going to be. You can't be perfect. You know, not everybody can be the Josh haters of the world, you know, but, or, you know, whoever else is doing it, but they're, you're going to fail. And so for me, it's just like, can I get back out there? Can I do it again? You know, and, and just to be available, like, you know, I know everybody loves to go analytically driven, you know, that's to, to determine the success of a player, but, you know, and I think in our world, we, we don't uh, look at those numbers as much as, you know, the fans do. Yeah. It, it can play a factor and it's a good measure to see where you're at, but like, that's not all, you know, that, we look at we're looking at okay well you know 
what was the score of the game? Did I limit? Did I give our team a chance to win the game? Okay, yes. You know, I might have gave up that game tying run, but it's still tied and we're still going into the eighth with the top of our lineup coming up. You know, there's still a chance to win this ball game. You know, just stuff like that. And, you know, I think that's what a lot of us do. And, you know, and especially for me, that's how I look at it. So you might not check your ERA, but what about some of those things like you go in the bullpen and you get, you know, full video breakdown of, you know, mechanically and release point and stuff like that. Is there is there a number or something specific you look in there to measure that a little bit more or is it is it just what you said? No, I, again, I think it's just what I said. If anything, like okay. numbers I'm looking at are just like, hey, what has this hitter done, you know, in the last like 10 games? What, you know, is he hot or is he cold? Like just stuff like that. Like, though, I, again, like I can, if you, if I start looking at my numbers and then I'm like, Oh my God, I have a 2.8. Now I'm, now I'm pitching for my numbers. I'm not pitching for the game or for the outs. I'm like, well, hopefully I don't get over three, you know, or hopefully, you know, I keep this around two. And then that's when things start to unravel. And, you know, and, and so I'm not ever really looking at that stuff. Yeah. It's cool to have good numbers. Yeah. That's great. Fantastic. Obviously you need that if you're going to stick around, but at the end of the day, like, I'm still getting out. So I'm still doing the right things. You know, I might get kicked in the stomach here every once in a while, but you know, at the end of the day, I'm available. I'm healthy. You can count on me to go out there when you need me. So that's, that's the main goal for me. Okay. How tough is it to get, to go back to back or to go three in a row? Cause sometimes like for fans watching at home, <laughs> I think, I think you see people sit there and say, Oh, like, are they going to use this guy? It's like, Oh, well he pitched the, the night before. And, and, you know, maybe he's down today, for example, like for you guys, like how much does that take to get out there for the second day in a row or even the third day in a row every now and then when guys go three straight, like, like what goes into that? I mean, it's, it's very tough. Cause again, like a lot of the times, like, what obviously like what the fans don't see is like obviously you go back to back and sometimes that back that second day doesn't go well well they didn't see that we might have warm up three times in a row and but didn't get in the game and then on that fourth time we eventually get into the game and then well you go in the game and it's like well you only threw 10 pitches well they don't count the warm-up pitches yesterday so you're hanging a little bit you're dragging so like that and you're just your body always feels a little differently you know it's never like how it did on the first day when you when you had time down and so it's like you you have to go back and you have to try and focus in on on your mechanics and not that can always get in the way when you're instead of you're just focusing on throwing strikes now you're like all right you know am i am i on time or am i behind or whatever it is like that that second day is always a little bit tougher some days now it's always different depending on the month if we're like you know in let's say September compared to, you know, March or whatever it is, right? Like, you know, August, September, back to back is going to suck a little worse compared to the beginning of the year. You know, obviously when you're fresh and you have those bullets reserved, but um, yeah, I mean, it's tough, but again, if you want to be a reliever and you want to stay in this league, you know, it's volatile, but you know, you have to do it and you just mental fortitude more than anything and just, just grind through it. That's all. And like, that's why it's even just like impressive to watch what like Matt Brash did this year. Like that guy's pitching in almost half of our games and in in his in a year where you have to face a three batter minimum compared to when you could just go in there and face one righty or one lefty and you know, you rack up ninety appearances and that's that's great, but you're only pitching point one. But you know, to see what Brash did, that was just like <laughs> and to consistently go out there and he's still ninety seven, ninety nine, a hundred every single time you're like dude how is this guy doing it and you know obviously the trainers do really they do a great job on keeping us healthy and um allowing us to do what we need to do to recover a lot of a lot of guys will be like well you did this or you did that and the manager's like hey if this makes you feel good and, and, and you trust us and you want to do that do it and so i think that's obviously a huge part in that and so it's just yeah i mean you got to just Got to get get through it a little bit. What was your reaction when you first saw Matt Brash slider? Um, in awe, it's just like ridiculous. <laughs> like, how is he making a ball move at that? And then when I'm like, I'm like, I kind of want to try in that. And then you go and look at his grip, <laughs> and you're like, never mind. Like, you know, it's like he's just so unique in everything that he does. Like, you just can't copy it. And you know, it's like, how does 
how is a powerful how is like so much power coming out of that small body you know and uh he's he's one of the best and yeah it's it's awesome to watch him go out there and make guys look foolish because again like not many people are able to spin batters around as much and frequently as he does it and so it's just like that just goes to show you like how gross his stuff is and you know he's he's uh truly special Taylor, last thing for me before we wrap it up with a few rapid fire questions. This, this your story's been documented. Jake RC on King Fi did, did a great story on you in spring <laughs> training about your journey through mental health. And if you want to go look at it, you can go find it on on King Five and on YouTube as well. So I don't I don't know if we need to talk about that specifically since that's out there. But I would imagine this season that you just had. I mean, your mental health was probably about as as good as it's been. You've been through this journey. You know what works for you and what doesn't. And the results were were there for you as well. How important is the mental side of this game as well to having success? Um, it's it's the biggest. I mean, that's kind of what I was talking about earlier. You know, to have you know the coaches tell you all these things, and that and obviously you believe that, and 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 you carry it out there. But you know, especially especially in sports. You know, every, emotions are, are waves. You've seen it in, you know, frustration, you know, you know, we all can imagine, you know, how easy it is because we're sitting on the couch, you know, and, and, but it, it is the most difficult thing to go through day to day because nobody wants to go out there and lose and you feel it more than ever. And I think just for me and this year, like I, I put a little bit more pressure on myself just because of you know, obviously of all the factors of, you know, playing of growing up here and all that stuff. But, you know, if you can go out there and, and you feel that people believe in you and you feel that, you know, you're doing all the right things, then your mental health will, will be okay. But at the end of the day, like, you just got to stay on the path that you're going on and, and trust the people around you and just lean into that. And that's all I did this year. You know, any time that, especially after my first, uh, my first bad outing in Texas, you know, I, I was riding that, that, uh, option train with the Blue Jays. So I only ever knew like, Hey, when you mess up, like you're probably going to Buffalo, you know, um, in this case it would have been Tacoma, but you know, I, um, I remember coming to the field that day and just probably the reason, one of the many reasons why, you know, Stephen Vogt is you know, the manager now for the guardians, it is, he came to me and I, and I always remember this cause you know, I was sitting there and obviously a little bit quieter than normal, just expecting, you know, the worst. Cause I think we called somebody up that day too. So I'm like, all right, well, it was a good run, you know, but it is what it is. I'll, I'll try and work to get back here. And I remember he came and pulled me aside and he was like, you doing all right. And I'm like, I'm, yeah, I'm doing all right. You know? And, uh, he was like, are you upset about yesterday? I'm like, well, of course I am. And I'm sitting here like that sucked, you know, like could have won that game. You know, obviously if I didn't do that, could have kept us in it, which I didn't. And he was like, he was like, so what? He was like, not one of us here. Don't think that you can't do it. You know, every single one of us believes in you. Every single one of us talk about how yesterday was nothing but a bad day. And that's all it is. And he was like, you can sit here and you can play the numbers game. And you can sit here and be like, oh, yeah, we could have won if you did this or that. But it didn't happen. And now we move on from it. And that that is what our mindset is. And that should be your mindset. And so, like, yeah, I, I worked on a lot of those things going up, uh, coming up here. But at the end of the day, those old habits still creep in. But like I said, when you lean into the people around you and you trust those people and you believe in what they're saying, it makes things a lot easier. And so that's all I did this year. And especially with the Mariners, you know, they just told me over and over, like, be you, be you, be you, and never be afraid to be you, regardless of what anybody says. And I think, again, like, that is why they get the best player out of you, because your your style is out there on the mound instead of, like, you're trying to fit somebody else's style. And, you know, and that's, I think that's why we have such a good clubhouse, too. And, and, and it's an easy place, because I've talked, with guys <clears throat> plenty of times, you know, this year or throughout this last year about like how they handle, you know, the stress of, you know, every day in the big leagues. Cause I, 
up to this point, like, yeah, I had a nice little run with the Blue Jays, but I never had a full year per se in the big league. So like, again, those day-to-day emotions of just like, how do you do this? And especially in um, September where things were tight and things were, you know, high pressure, it was, you, you'd leaned on the guys because, you know, we fell short and we know that. And, but we all leaned in on each other and I, you have that special bond with everybody. And I haven't had that since I've been in the big leagues um, until I got here. And so you feel that you can trust and talk to anybody, anybody about what was going on and, and it made it a really great working environment. That's really cool. And, okay. So off that, the last thing I had for you before we get to a couple of fun questions to wrap this up was the two outings that stick out to me the most from you this year were an outing at home against the pirates. And then that save you had in Anaheim, which I mean, I remember you being just fired up after those two outings, which I think is one of many reasons. A lot of fans relate to you in that way. I mean, not just being from the area, not just growing up a Seattle sports fan, but just like, you know, you, you let your emotions out there. I mean, both when it's really good and, and even when it's a little bit on, on the downside too. But I mean, those two outings you had where you get out of huge jams, they're big moments in the game. They're late in the game and you just kind of let it rip. Can you even describe what that feeling is like when you get out of a jam like that late in a game? Uh, it's just pure electricity. Um, you know, it, the crowd helps a lot too. Um, obviously, the setting helps a lot too. Um, but for me, I think because I'm, I'm not normally a big like yell on the mound kind of guy, but I think I just wasn't really given those opportunities growing up. I've always been a competitor. Like, I love to compete. doesn't matter if I'm playing pop or shot or if I'm closing out a game. It doesn't matter. Like, you're going to get the same competitor out of me no matter what it is. But um, I've always gone with a little bit of the quieter approach. But when you're in situations like that and, you know, it's a sold-out crowd and, you know, you got bases loaded, 3-2 count, you know, one of their young promising hitters up there, um, which it was Brian Hayes, you know, like, and you have a righty, and you know that, like, everyone on their side is like, well, the matchup's saying that it should be Cabrian, and that, you know, righty smashed me a lot, and, it is, you know, and then you go out there and you prove them wrong, you know, it's it's like you feel that energy go through you, and you just kind of just got to let it out. And, you know, and especially, like, a save against the, the Angels, or I think that was the win. Um, you know, again, like, nobody expects me to be in that moment. Nobody, I, I mean, I heard it on the announcers. Nobody really wanted me in that moment. They were like, why isn't Gabe here in this moment? Why, you know, why isn't, why are we doing this? And, you know, and you go out there and again, you prove them wrong. And you're like, <laughs> you know, hey, I, I could do this. And, and, you know, like, look what I just did. And that was, that was really cool. So, yeah, it's just pure electricity. That's all it is. Okay, you say you love to compete. When you had that Seahawks helmet on, doing the pregame throws with the football on this year, what's your comp- compete level at one through ten? All right, we gotta get, we gotta get that first down. You know, we gotta complete the pass. <laughs> so, you know, that was that was good. We love it. Okay, we've got like five kind of rapid fire questions to wrap this up with you before we call it before we call it close. The first one we have for you is your go to pregame and postgame meal is what. Mm. My go-to, um, I'm a big pre-game grilled cheese. Right. Uh, grilled cheese or a quesadilla. I don't, I don't like to eat a whole lot uh, before a game. Uh, I, I just never, I don't like to feel full out there or anything. So keep it small. Grilled cheese, maybe some fruit, either grilled cheese or quesadilla post-game. Now. <laughs> might expose me a little bit but i didn't ever really eat at the field i ate a lot of wendy's son of (laughs) son of baconator and a six-piece spicy nug with the honey mustard and a lemonade that was kind of my thing i didn't i know that uh you got to eat healthy but sometimes (laughs) when you come back and it's like it's like cod stew you're like i'm gonna i'm gonna go with some some wendy's today yeah so, so yeah so when you're a big leaguer you can upgrade from the four for four yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah been there done that um yeah. okay next question um your three favorite tv shows ever 
uh, Mandalorian, Breaking Bad, and um, uh, third one. I don't know. Um, probably season one of Loki. I don't know. Oh. Marvel guy. So, um, yeah, probably probably season one of Loki. Season two was all right, but. I will say, like, I, I love Mandalorian, too. I, I know Lyle does, too. We're, we're also big Star Wars fans. But I never I never hear it get thrown around in, in best TV show. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll oh, have yeah. to reconsider. It's up there right. for me, but maybe not number one. Um, for me, it, it's probably it probably goes Breaking Bad and then Mandalorian. But, mm -hmm. I mean, nothing fired me up like when Luke Skywalker came out of that shit. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I knew right away. I was watching it with my parents. And they said they only watch those shows, so I can always give them, like, the the background details of everything happening. Yeah. I remember we were watching. I was like, Oh my God, it's happening. Oh my God. And they were like, what's happening? What's happening? They're like, do we need to pause? I'm like, do not touch the remote. So that's, <laughs> that's how big I fan I am. So yeah, uh, I think, um, definitely breaking bad number one. Um, and then Mandalorian number two. I somehow didn't pick up on it when that scene happened in, in Mando where like the X-Wing fighter comes in. Like, I didn't think that Luke would have still had it for whatever reason. So I didn't oh, even I, realize it till they put him on camera. I just wasn't even thinking about it, but yeah, you were, you were out ahead of it. Oh yeah. I saw it right away. I knew, I, I knew that <laughs> X-Wing right there. I was like, that's, that's him. So that was cool. Well, maybe that's a whole conversation for another time is just <laughs> dive deep into star Wars talk. I'm, but, I'm so down. <laughs> okay. If you weren't playing baseball, third question here, what do you think you'd be doing? I see. So that's a, that's a funny question. Cause I've never, ever had anything where I'm like, hey, I'll do this. You know, here's my backup plan. <laughs> Squeeze shade is I never had a plan B. And so I don't, I don't know what I would do. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. I don't know. I'll cross that bridge when I get there. So, but my ideal, my ideal, uh, dream job would probably just be like be a streamer something like that you know <laughs> that's what i was gonna say is your backup plan be a worldwide twitch streamer exactly yeah so i, I started that uh started getting that thing going so we'll we'll see but yeah maybe if things all fail maybe that's what i do it's a pretty good contingency plan i'd say <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh who is your favorite all-time baseball player favorite all-time baseball player felix hernandez pretty good choice yeah. this podcast concurs yeah <laughs> Did you get to, oh yeah you caught his first pitch this year didn't you no i didn't get to catch his first oh. pitch but i was in his uh um the hall of fame speech not not That's by right. him but by Stanton. um just you know he was talking about how like felix and inspired people and he was like inspired our own players and he said a few guys and i was in that and i was like so again, that was another one of those moments where I'm like, again, my favorite player in the world, and somehow I get to be in a Mariners uniform in the dugout and watching him get uh, inducted in the Mariners Hall of Fame, and then my name gets on there. I'm like, oh, this is crazy. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, yeah. so who was the first pitch that you did catch this year? Then was it Richard Sherman? Uh, yeah, I caught. Um, okay. Well, I was trying to get. It was Doug Baldwin, um, uh, Michael. Michael Bennett and mm. uh, I think it was KJ Wright. No, mm. anyways, it was one of the it was those those three guys. But yeah, I was wanted to catch Doug Baldwin, but um, we had one uh, one ten at the time. We were we were supposed to go one by one, mm -hmm. and one didn't know like who was who, so he just went on Doug Baldwin and. <laughs> I uh, ended up having to catch Michael Bennett, and I was nervous, a little nervous. And Michael Bennett <laughs> threw one a little high and uh -huh. went sailing. And I thought I had it like I just kind of short armed it and it went right above my head. And there was a camera guy, and it kind of squared him up in the in the no no zone. And uh, <laughs> Michael Bennett started yelling at me like, "Why didn't you catch that?" And I was like, "Cut! It didn't cut." Um, I was like, it cut. He was like, no, it didn't. You just made me look bad. I'm like, no, I'm a hero. <laughs> and then uh, I caught uh, Jamie Moyer. Um, that was pretty cool. And 
I caught Phoenix Jr. Oh. So I caught a few guys. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that that was all. And I think I, I can't remember. It's been such a long season, but I'm pretty sure I got to catch uh, all the root. Pretty sure all the root. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a few, few Mariners, the Ox. Um, but yeah, bad on. That's my bad, Michael Bennett. My bad. <laughs> we'll try to pass along the message if we ever in a million years ever came across them. Um, <laughs> Okay, the last one I have for you. We've asked a couple of the minor leaguers that if you were to make your big league debut today, like what would the song, what would either your walk up song be or your entrance song be when you enter the field? But for you, I've got to ask because you've had the same walk up song for or entrance song for a decent while now, and it's the most fitting song I think ever. <laughs> In fact, funny enough, before I'd ever heard it played at the stadium for you when entering the game, I thought to myself, you think Taylor Saucedo would ever use too much sauce as his walk-up song? I asked TJ that, and he's like, I don't know, maybe. And then I heard it, and I was like, oh, like, let's go. Like, he actually <laughs> uses it. So I guess my question is, how long after that song came out did you say, oh, I have to use this? I think it was, like, the first night it dropped. Because I used to uh, be a really big feature fan. And so I think, like, the first night it dropped, I was like, I just found my walkout song for <laughs> however long I play baseball now. And yeah, I mean, it just stuck. So I didn't use it for a while here just because like I never said anything. I just like didn't go with the walkout. I just, which I don't know why, like everywhere I go, I'm like kind of make that my walkout. But once I did, it, it was just like, it was pretty cool just again to hear it in Safeco. I'm going to say Safeco. But yeah, um, yeah, it was pretty cool. Okay, follow up to that quick follow up. We also said before Brian Wu debuted, we were like, would he ever use the Wu by Pop Smoke? And then he did use it. <laughs> now, maybe you know the answer to this. Maybe you don't. But has he been using that a long time, too? Or was that a first season thing for him? I'm not I'm not too sure. Um, mm-hmm. That's for, Hopefully, you guys can get him on there. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. But that's a uh, perfect, perfect walkout for him. Well, tip of the cap to you. Like you said, you've got your walk-up song picked for basically the rest of the time. And it worked. It worked beyond belief <laughs> this year. So. Absolutely. Well, Taylor, this has been awesome. We <laughs> really, really appreciate all the time you took to sit here and kind of chop it up with us. I hope fans enjoyed the interview. I'm sh- I'm guessing that they did. I And um, hopefully we can do it again soon at some point because we really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Anytime. Okay, I think I can speak for both of us when I say that was a pretty cool conversation, right? Yeah, it was. It's always good to you know, get these guys off the field and get a little bit more of a genuine side. I'll just, I don't, I don't want to speak for Taylor, but that's about as genuine as you will get from a professional athlete ever, like ever, unless you're do unless it's like, I don't know, like Paul George's podcast where it's like player versus player. I mean, you don't really get the authentic side of, of athletes that often. But here we are, I mean, hearing about how Taylor Saucedo got lost in Queen Anne somehow after a after a Kraken game and didn't know where to go and followed the North Star home. So um we're so happy that Taylor took some time to to join us. It it made our lives better. I'm sure I'm sure uh, we helped entertain him enough too. That was that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I mean, genuine, he was funny, pretty open to talking. He shared some bullpen conspiracy theories. Yeah, all around. It was just, it was a really, really cool conversation. So we certainly enjoyed it. We hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want just a little synopsis of who Taylor Saucedo is, the first time I ever had a conversation with him, it was early on when we were doing some of the mini mic interviews that we do at the field. And I asked him, I said, Hey, do you have like 30 seconds? And he actually had to run in, like he had somewhere he had to be. So he started to run in. He goes down the dugout steps. He gets about halfway down and he turns back around and he comes back up the steps. And he said, Actually, no, don't worry about it. I got a few minutes, so I can definitely spare 30, 60 seconds. No worries. And and that was my first interaction with him. And even back then, I was like, you probably don't get that out of a lot of big leaguers. So from that point on, I was like, that's a pretty cool dude. And then the more and more, not just us, but plenty of fans got to see who he was throughout the year, not just on the field with how well he pitched, but his personality, how active he is on social media. It's been really cool to follow. And the fact that he sat down for 50 minutes or so with us to kind of just talk, talk and all. Yeah, we had a blast with it. So we appreciate the time Taylor took, and we hope you guys enjoyed the interview. With that, that'll just about wrap up this edition of the Marine Layer Podcast. You guys know the drill. You want to listen to the full-form podcast, you can do so wherever you get your audio side of your podcast. You do that, make sure to follow the show, download, 
leave us a five-star review. Those reviews and downloads, they do help us out a bunch. So just take a couple extra seconds to do that. Go watch on YouTube too. If you want to see all of Taylor's reactions to this interview, it's all over on the YouTube side. Go like, comment, subscribe over there. And follow us on social media on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube shorts at Marine Layer Pod. That's TJ. I'm Lyle. As always, we thank you guys for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.